will now commence in public session. Apologies have been received from Senators Ivana Batchik and Ned O'Sullivan, um, from Deputy Maureen O'Sullivan. Um, Deputy Angus O'Snodig is substituting for Deputy Sean Crow for this part of the meeting, and Senator Gerald Crockwell is deputised for Senator Billy Lawless. In today's meeting, we meet with um, PD Fora, and I welcome um, Jerry Guinan, um, Mark Keane, Amy Timmons, Mark Bright, and also Dunham Maguire. Um, you are all very welcome here today. The members of the committee look forward to hearing your presentation and having an exchange of views with you. Before we, be we begin, can I remind members, witnesses and persons in the public gallery to turn off their mobile phones? Members too are requested to ensure that for the duration of the meeting their mobile phones are turned off completely or switched to airplane safe or flight mode depending on the, on the device. It is not sufficient for members to just put their phones in silent mode as this will maintain the level of interference with the broadcasting system. By virtue of Section 72L of the Defamation Act of 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to the Joint Committee. If they are directed by the Chairman to cease giving evidence on a particular matter and continue to do so, they are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of their evidence. They are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and they are asked to respect the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person or body outside the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. I now call on Mr Guinan to make your opening statement. Mr Guinan. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, my name is Gerard Guinan. I'm the General Secretary of PD4. I'm a serving corporal in the Ordnance Corps. Uh, on my left is, pres is our President, Mr Mark Keane. Mark is a petty officer, currently serving member of the Naval Service. Uh, to his left is Mr Martin Bright, Deputy General Secretary. Martin is a senior NCO who has spent his career serving in the Infantry Corps, both unit and formation HQ. To my uh, right is Ms Amy Timmins. Amy is a member of our National Executive and currently serves as a corporate within the Military Police Corps. In the gallery is our Association's Vice President, Mr Dunham McGuire, who holds the rank of private and currently serves in an infantry unit. Between those present here today, <clears throat> there are in excess of 130 years service for the state and its citizens, with significant amounts of overseas service included within that time. Um, so while PD4 does not operate a military rank structure, within our association we represent all ranks of enlisted personnel throughout the Defence Force. Okay. So firstly, let me thank the committee members for affording PD4 the opportunity to opportunity to appear before you here today. PD4 is established under the Defence Amendment Act 1990 and represents over 6,500 enlisted members of the Defence Forces. Our membership density, depending on recruit cadet numbers, can range as high as 90 per cent of all enlisted personnel. <coughs> Our membership encompasses all branches of the service, including Navy, Air Corps and Army. PD4 has seen and welcomes the significant level of engagement by the Joint Committee on defence issues over the past year and believe it would be opportune to seek an audience after the publication of the Public Service Pay Commission report. The Association believed that to engage now would provide PD4 with the opportunity to discuss the findings or recommendations made and to appraise the Committee of difficulties being faced by our membership. It will come as no surprise to the Committee that central to these difficulties are the issues of pay and allowances afforded to members of the Defence Forces, the application of the Working Time Directive and the current difficulties being experienced per by personnel vis-à-vis -vis their contracts of service. This hearing also provides the Committee members with the opportunity to explore any areas with us that you might feel relevant in the context of your duties as Dáil Deputies. When I requested an audience with the Committee a number of weeks ago, I had expected the report of the Public Service Pay Commission to be published last week before I submitted this written statement. However, unfortunately, the report was not available at that time. Um, needless to say, the delay in the publication of the report has been extremely frustrating for our association and members and gave rise to significant levels of commentary on both social media and in the public sphere from people who were unaware that discussions were being held in the background on various issues associated with paying conditions ancillary to the Commission's report. I know, having viewed the earlier hearing by the other representative body in front of the Committee, that you are well aware of current churn and staffing levels throughout various parts of the Defence Organisation. 
these staffing shortfalls have, as articulated previously, resulted in extreme stress and anxiety for personnel and their families. The lack of proper remuneration has further impacted on morale of personnel, which ultimately reflects on operational uh, effectiveness. The manner by which PD4 would like to address the current crisis in the Defence Forces and by extension the Commission's report is thus a historical context of pay movements in the Defence Forces and what was sought by PD4 in the context of the Public Service Pay Commission, why increases were sought in the manner that they were and what the outcome from the Commission was. I take it that you'll ask me about that aspect of my statement because I had expected the Commission to publish this report yesterday. The history of pay in the Defence Forces is a mirror of boom-bust cycles within the economy generally, with significant periods of pay lag and upswings compared to other public servants. These lags have generally been followed by significant awards. Evidence of the foregoing can be found in the Gleeson Commission Report of 1990. The Gleeson Commission Report shows a revision of pay rates in 1942. In 1946, awards of 40-50% to were made to privates. In 1946, awards of 40 to 18.2 was given to privates. In 1964, an executive award was made to enlisted personnel. In 1970, a working group made sizable recommendations on pay. In 1990, the Gleason Commission made recommendations for increases of significant amounts also. So, what's the point of this history lesson? Simple. What is happening in the Defence Forces is complete madness. It's history repeating itself every few decades with huge turmoil in the defence forces in the build up to the awards necessary to sustain retention and encourage recruitment. During the most recent cycle, I and my colleagues in PD4 have seen the human cost of austerity and the denial of recognition of the problems that exist within the defence forces. My predecessor raised the issue of pay and allowances before the Public Accounts Committee in 2012. In 2014, PD4 raised the issue of people sleeping in cars. The association fought tooth and nail for the reversal of the post-2013 pay scales and were ultimately successful after a difficult fight. PD4 has brought these issues to the attention of those in power at the early stages. We saw the trends because we work on the ground. The difficulty for our association was simple. We didn't have the headline numbers that now exist and hence we were called alarmist. Thus, I have to ask, who's alarmist now? All the foregoing takes us up to the current situation within the Defence Forces. It is not an overstatement to say we have lost significant numbers of highly qualified, outstanding so soldiers, sailors and air crew over the past few years. These personnel left with a deep sense of betrayal and disenfranchisement that will never be assuaged. They were forced from a career that they loved and that owed them much more than they ever received. But they might have stayed if only some earlier intervention had occurred. In February 2018, PD4 made a comprehensive submission to the Public Service Pay Commission. Our submission was 120 pages long, despite a request to limit its submission to a data-only submission. For our part, the Association believed that the Commission would be best placed to make a judgment when the totality of our situation was apparent. This view was articulated in our oral submission in March of this year, where we described data-led assessments as having a significant degree of survivorship bias. As part of our oral submission, PD4 sought increases in military service allowances and increases in duty payments. PD4 had sought to have duty allowances increased to a level, at the least, where members were paid the national minimum hourly rate of pay for those hours, hours worked above normal routine. This would, in PD4's opinion, have been consistent with Labour Court recommendations regarding the sleepover allowances paid to carers in the HSE. While PD4 understands that significant difficulties exist in teasing out issues related to duty payments, as in some instances it is paid flat rated, like border duty allowance and army ranger wing allowance, while in other instances it is paid at a daily rate, such as patrol duty allowance, EOD allowance and security duty allowances. This payment regime does a disservice to all personnel. For example, 
Members of the Army Ranger Wing have, over the past number of years, seen the value of their allowances fall relative to other enlisted personnel who have secured holiday pay on their security duty allowance payments. Additionally, members of the ARW saw their allowance cut in line with other duty allowances, yet remain static subsequent to the provision of holiday pay. Moreover, it must be remembered that these personnel are still fighting for the retrospective payment of increases back to 2006, as the Department of Defence had always espoused the view that increases were being held in escrow. Unfortunately, despite the guidance of the International Labour Organisation, which holds that those deemed essential service should have access to a CNA scheme and that awards, once made, should be implemented promptly, these payments have not been made. Members of the Defence Forces are essential services. They cannot strike and should thus be afforded in a manner consistent with the foregoing provisions, as Ireland is a member of the ILO since 1923. The failure to secure advances through the CNA process has resulted in our association having to resort to ever greater numbers of legal actions. This approach comes at a cost of self-restriction of information flow to members as the legal strategy can be fluid and legal rules regarding disclosure can apply. In so much as it gets results, PD4 has no remorse for undertaking legal actions. PD4 members who give such loyal service to the state deserve results no matter how they come. However, I do believe that taxpayers should question the efficacy of the prevailing norm <clears throat> of pushing PD4 into a situation where they know we will go to court to vindicate the rights of our members. I have frequently told officials at conciliation and arbitration that it is disgraceful that so solicitors and barristers will be getting rich off the intransigence to resolve matters at a lower level. By way of example, recently, PD4 went to the WRC for the return of payment of rations to Air Corps apprentices. The claim value, approximately 800 euros. At that hearing, we had a solicitor, a barrister, the departmental side had the same on the day. 20 minutes before the hearing was to take place, an offer to settle was made. It cost many times more in legal fees than the claim itself. This is a waste of resources, and money must, and must be called out. The foregoing case is not unique. The O'Donnell case last year is another example. In 2014-2015, PD4 decided on a change of IR strategy, as we witnessed other bodies take the approach of going to court and vindicating the rights of their members. Hospital consultants had significant monies returned to them following issues with their contracts. A rent allowance claim for doctors was settled in 2017. All these settlements occurred without any real fanfare, strikes, protests or media. I will conclude this element of our submission as I am aware of the time constraints in the initial statement. But before I finish up, I will give the committee this piece of factual information that PD4 advanced for the increase in duty rates. In 1990, the Gleeson Commission recommended an increase in the rate of weekday, Saturday and Sunday duties. The rates were increased by nearly 50% for weekdays and 100% for Saturdays. An increase from £29.14 for Sundays and Defence Force holidays to £40 was also recommended. At the time of the change, the new rate of Sunday duty represented 20.5% of the pay of a private at the first point of the scale and 1626 of the salary of a private at the top of the scale. In 2013, as part of the Haddington Road Agreement, duty rate premiums for Saturday and Sunday were equalised with weekday rates and cut by a further 10%. This has resulted in current rates only being equal to 10.9% of a private at the top of, first point of the scale and 6.2% of the salary of a private at the top of the scale. Accordingly, it must be appreciated that the value being placed on the additional hours worked by personnel is being undervalued considerably much more so than it was 30 years ago. PD4 contests that no other area of the public or civil service has suffered such a devaluation. 
Many other areas of, P of PD4's 2018 submission remain unexplored. These must be addressed so as to arrest the current outflow of personnel. Failure to grasp the nettle will, will now result in the repeat of the mistakes of the past. The application of the Working Time Directive has an important bearing on the rates of pay and the feelings of being valued as employees. While the Directive is primarily concerned with the welfare, health and safety of employees, when it is not implemented, it leads to employees feeling that their employer does not care for their welfare. Additionally, when CSO figures are presented in terms of average earnings, they are given over average times. Within the Defence Forces, no time records exist. Yet, all members know that they are working far greater than the average, which leads to the conclusion that they are well below the average in pay, significantly above the average in time worked, and consequently the worst paid and undervalued public servants in the country. Much of the current difficulties arise from a 1989 declaration to the Gleeson Commission that the provision of overtime was an anathema to military service. PD4 has long held the view that the member of the General Staff who made that statement undermined the entitlement of our members to fair day's pay for fair day's work. He is, no doubt, still held in high regard within the Department of Finance. The foregoing assertion raised the concept of duty to a level beyond the need to appreciate human dignity and basic needs of members, their wives, partners and children. Why does it have to be said, and not appreciated as a matter of course, that members of the Defence Force's welfare, health and safety is no less worthy of protection during non-operational periods as the next citizens? However, Many are still caught in the foregoing mindset, despite the realisation that our personnel are our greatest asset. The concept that the sum does not work without the parts has been lost. For example, recent discussions at CNA show a desire to have significant periods of our members' time exempt from the scope of consideration under the directive. This will not work. Time has value. Our association has no intention of repeating the mistakes of the past. I am, however, pleased to report that some progress on this issue has been made in the past number of weeks. Again, it has come following the initiation of legal action by our association and long, arduous exchanges of correspondence. From the perspective of PD4, there, there needs to be greater engagement with the realisation that the longer the delay in implementing the Working Time Directive in a bespoke manner, the greater the negative impact on both the reputation of the Defence Forces and retention of currently serving members. Lastly, on the issue of contracts, PD4 has spent the better part of 25 years fighting for appropriate contracts for personnel. The Association has expended considerable resources down through the years attempting to address an issue which goes to the heart of service. In effect, from the day and hour that personnel enter service, they are counting down until they are discharged, regardless of personal circumstances or ability. This impacts on loyalty. Presently, a lacuna exists in respect of privates and corporates who enlisted since 1994. They are allowed to remain in service until the end of 2022 or until they reach 50 years of age. Currently, sergeants who attain 50 years of age are also to be discharged. This is wrong. This is a sinful waste of critical experience and loyalty at a time when the defence forces are, uh, when the numbers departing are in free fall. I'll finish by saying, simply put, pay and allowances for our members must be addressed appropriately or no functioning organisation will exist. Our association would ask that the issue of regularisation of contracts needs to be raised by the committee members into the future. The application of the Working Time Directive is something that our association can and will press with the courts if need be. I would respectfully ask the committee to re-invite PD4 to discuss issues on a six-monthly or annual basis. This would not be a wasted exercise. The Defence Forces belongs to you, our citizenry. And at this point in our nation's history, they need to be mined by you, the democratic institutions of the state. 
They need you to care for them through what will no doubt be an extremely rocky road to recovery. In the foregoing respect, PD4 intends to honour the thoughts of Patrick Pearce when he said, we have not lost. To refuse to fight would have been to lose. To fight is to win. We have kept the faith with the past and handed on a tradition to the future. PD4 intends to fight and hand on a better defence forces to those who come after us, our children, our nephews and nieces, our comrades. I'll conclude by thanking our members and their families for standing by us and for helping PD4 a bolster the case for increases in allowances. On behalf of our members, I wish to again thank the committee for your work. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, thank you very much, Mr Guyne, and we welcome your very detailed presentation in regard to the many issues confronting your members and the importance of addressing those issues. And it's clear that it's, um, some of the issues can be dealt with without any substantial state expenditure in regard to the organisation, working time directive rights, in pay and conditions as well. We are very limited in time because we, we, I um, brought this as an extra meet to facilitate the presentation by PD4 after Senator Layton spoke to me in regard to the importance of hearing from PD4. So I want to remind colleagues, we have another meeting at 11 o'clock, we have a Good Friday committee meeting at 12 and we have another Foreign Affairs committee meeting at 2. We're very constrained time-wise. So I'm insisting on members not making statements, questions only and the contributions will be grouped. So the, the first people who have, who have indicated are Deputy Jack Chambers and Deputy Noel Greedish. Deputy Chambers, questions only for both, and then I'll go back to Mr Guinan. Thank you, sir, and uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Jerry, Amy, Mark and Martin, uh, and Donna, who who's there as well in the gallery, and thank PD4 for your uh, very comprehensive statement and the work you've been doing on behalf of your your, your members. Um, so just first question relates to the, the Pay Commission uh, and obviously what, why, what's your sense of the ongoing delay and, and why do you think uh, this is continuing to be delayed despite the Minister having read the report he confirmed in the Dáil in the last couple of weeks? Uh, what do you think, why do you think they're fudging this issue and continuing to delay it? Uh, and the, the leaks have confirmed that for a private of less than three years, it would be uh, they'd receive 96 cent before tax per day. Um, what message would that give to members if that's what the Pay Commission actually delivered uh, for someone uh, in terms of the military service allowance and the change to it? Uh, I know there's been significant concern that that could send the wrong message and could drive a greater exodus uh, from the defence forces. Uh, in terms of the CNA scheme, obviously we've had difficulty, you've had expressed your difficulties with that, that you've ended up uh, in the courts um, more often than, than not, uh, which has impact on your members and continued and delayed significant issues there. Uh, how, what, are there serious issues with the integrity of the CNA scheme? Is it a delay tactic by the department? Uh, and, for example, we, we, I know we sent the, you know, we've recently going to be deploying the Army Ranger Wing to Bali. Um, how do you feel about the ongoing delay t to their payments that have been uh, continually put, put on the long finger uh, by the department? And then on the department, uh, how is your relationship with the department? I know uh, the previous association that was here expressed the serious dysfunction that's there uh, and the difficulty they have in dealing with the department on matters of uh, policy. Um, in terms of the issue around uh, voting, uh, the Minister has confirmed there's a review ongoing now because many of your members uh, weren't able to exercise their basic democratic right in the recent local and European elections. As, but there's been a number of confirmed cases uh, where the democratic process broke down, but only for members of our defence forces, uh, effectively second class citizens by the electoral system in this state in the last local and European elections. Um, how do you feel about that? And uh, you, perhaps you, want to, you might want to comment uh, on it. In terms of the issues around health, um, I know you, as an association, you have, you have to run your own, some of your own um, uh, diagnostic investigations privately because of the failure of the current health system for your members. Um, perhaps you want to give some detail about why you're having to do that and what impact that's having on the physical and mental health 
uh, of your um, members. Uh, and just, I suppose, I know you, perhaps you want to comment. I know the government made an award, uh, signed off on payment for uh, judges in recent days. Uh, and had no difficulty uh, giving a pay award to some of the highest paid in the public service. How do you feel about your members being denied uh, their increases in paying allowances uh, ongoing? Um, and then also, finally, just on the uh, accommodation issues, um, I know this, many of your members are having to spend their days off sleeping on ships in overcrowded accommodation and because they can't afford rent. We've heard a lot of announcements and re-announcements from government about uh, accommodation uh, and providing for that, but nothing has happened. Um, do you want to give some perhaps real stories about what your members are experiencing in terms of the um, accommodation issues? And also on the national minimum wage, do you feel your members are de facto being paid less than the minimum wage uh, when you take the hours they're working and the underpayment and under delivery of say duty allowance uh, on a weekly basis and uh, how do they how do, how, what's the real life experience for them if they're having to uh, be paid obviously we know they're the worst paid in the public service which is shocking mm. um, but the fact that the state is openly breaching its own legislation around minimum wage criteria uh, Perhaps you want to comment on that. And thanks again for coming before us. Thanks, Deputy Chairman. Deputy Noel Greedish. And I'll go back to Mr. Guinan then. Okay. I want to thank the members of PD Fora for coming in and giving them giving us a presentation. We had a presentation recently from RACO also, the commissioned officers, and they painted a bleak picture no more than yourselves. And a number of questions, and I'll adhere to what the, the Cahirlik said, and I know my colleague has raised there, but the Public Service Pay Commission. In your submission to the Public Service Pay Commission, what kind of engagement did you feel that they had with you? And are you confident that something will, positive will come out of that? And on this, have you um, compared what, say, other countries' pay and conditions, say, like the UK and, and France, are you lagging behind them? And if you are, how far are you behind them in regards to pay uh, and conditions and service abroad payments? Uh, as you know, the we all know where the Irish Army are, are serving all over the world and now going to Malawi, so maybe you might elaborate on that. I know um, there's a number of members who's, who get the working family payment. I think it was 90. I think that's 90 too many within the Defence Forces. There should be nobody within the Defence Forces uh, receiving the working family payment uh, FISC. According to the Department, they say there's only roughly about 90, which is 90 too many maybe, there might be more than that or less than that if you could operate on that. I asked the question uh, of the last group that was before us, where has it all gone wrong? Uh, Gerard Hurden, I'm sure you know, said that the relationship between the department is dysfunctional and broken. Where do you feel the problem is? Who is not, not fighting up on the higher echelons of the Defence Forces? Is it in the senior officers or is it the officials within the department or is it uh, the minister? This is going any time there's questions in the doll, uh, Chairman, uh, it's constantly about pay and conditions for the members of the Defence Forces. And a lot of that should be the excellent work that the members of the Defence Forces do. So maybe, I'm conscious of the time, and I know there's other um, um, people who want to come in, maybe you could elaborate on a few questions that I asked there. And thanks again for your presentation. Thank you, thanks, Deputy Greenish. Mr. Guyner. Thank you very much. Or you can bring in any of your colleagues if you wish. Okay. Uh, I suppose, Deputy uh, Chambers, the, the Pay Commission's report, um, to say we're angry would be an understatement. Um, we expected this report three to four weeks ago. Um, I mean, words I actually can't express, they, they escape me as to how angry I am about the fact that it's not done. But um, I know that we had been engaged in the background. I, the remediation going on in relation to the Working Time Directive, I'm precluded from actually divulging what the details of that are, but there is a um, settlement offer on the table in relation to it, and um, I was engaged in 14 hours of mediation talks a number of weeks ago, and I think potentially at that point in time there could have been a, a desire to bundle everything up, if, if you know what I mean, that uh, you had your working time directive, the results from the mediation kind of come out with the Pay Commission, with a number of other issue, issues that we're actually working on in the background. 
Could have been. I don't know, but th that is actually happening. Um, there's also... Uh, look at... Uh, members on the ground are just... Uh, they're at the end of their tether with this. If this was them, they, 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 the hypocrisy is just lost on them, uh, to tell you the truth, because if they were to do their job, or they believed that they were to do their job in such a tardy fashion, to be on the mat, that's a term used for, you'd be facing military discipline, like, um, for, uh, you know, um, incitement to disaffection or some other charge against military law. Um, members have had enough. They just want to see this report, good, bad or indifferent, uh, and let them decide as to what to make of it. Like. As it is, people are just walking out the door because they're tired of it. They're tired of being treated like second-class citizens, that they don't matter. Um, they do. They are vital to this state. They undertake training that is, doesn't even feature in people's worst nightmare. You know, they walk around in NBC suits in the middle of summer, like, uh, they jump from helicopters and they train to get up sort of ships and, and run the risk of injury every single day in the jobs that they do. And they, they look at the democratic institutions of this state and they kind of say, why have you failed us? And this is just another failure as they see it to be, that this report has not been published in a timely fashion. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I can't answer for um, government departments and why reports aren't out, but I can tell you we're annoyed. We're just at the end of the, our tethered in relation to this. Like, I hope that you get the frustration. It's palpable. palpable. The, the, the Defence Forces at the moment is a tinderbox. People are just... Morale is on the floor. And I am, I suppose, the living embodiment, and, and I'm supposed to come here and, and you know, represent my members. And I, there's, I, I can't. I, I, I can't enough. I, 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 you want to go out and scream it from the rooftops. And you, you want to kind of say stuff like, that's, um, that's bad. But I know I have to go back in next week and talk to these officials and get on with them. And that's, that's my problem is that I have to bundle all this up inside and sort of, but at the same time represent my members. I hope everybody appreciates that we are, we have just come to the end of the rope. It, this needs to be published now and it needs to be done. Uh, in terms of the, the, um, the this pr purported pay awards to um, uh, junior privates, again, I can't comment on it because I don't know. Um, you know, what's there, um, people will put out 96 cents a day or whatever before tax. And, and I know you've said it, and you know, I, you're a very strong advocate for the Defence Forces. You have been. Um, I mean, there's not a, probably not a deputy in this room that I haven't met in the past couple of months. You know, <laughs> Senator, sorry, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> I have, I've plagued you all. Um, you know, and you've all been very good to us. You raise stuff that we ask you to raise, and um, but I, I can't. If, if, if it was just 96 cent, yeah, you, you're right. People would be walking out the door. Um, I hope to God there's more than that in it. Um, I believe there is. I, I, you know, I, I have to believe that there's more than that. That all of this is not for naught that we are going to save people that want to remain in service. We have to. There, there's no alternative. We have to. Uh, so it has to be better than 96 cent today. Um, I mean, I know the purported, what's in the media about the 10% on allowances and uh, MSA and stuff like that. Um, it won't be enough to save the Navy. I don't believe it. Navy is in, in a dire state like and those people deserve more. They deserve more than that. And um, I mean, if you take, the, if you take uh, our naval service, it um, patrols. If we were, if we, if we included our, our, our sea area, we'd be the fourth biggest country in Europe because of our sea mass, or you know, our sea territory. Um, and these guys go on, on a daily basis and they patrol and they do a hard job. 
and uh, yeah, if it's just 10% is not enough, we're going to have to go back and fight for more for them. That's it, plain and simple. On the CNA scheme, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's dysfunctional. It was dysfunctional to the point in time where we went to the European Social Rights Committee in 2014 and we took a claim um, you know, in relation to uh, freedom of association and uh, right, to collect and bar right to collective bargaining. And in that respect, I have to thank you actually for your motion last week and the aspect of you know, um, p allowing PD4 to, to uh, associate with ICTO. Um, we went because there was, a, there was a standing joke in our office that you know, people had, had done the no course on the far side of the table. We'd look for something and it was just no as a matter of course. And um, that was, like I said, effectively that's when, when we kind of kicked in and we said, listen, um, the people who founded our association, um, they were visionary. They said, let's have a fighting fund there, a legal fighting fund. And I looked at it and kind of said, well, why you have millions in the bank and not use it to the benefit of the members and go to court. I never wanted to go to court. The association never wanted to go to court. We wanted to use the conciliation and arbitration process to get, to improve the paying conditions of our members through that scheme. But there was nothing happening. And even when you brought claims that were, that were irrefutable, like, as far as we were concerned. I mean, the, the, the example there of the, the Susan O'Donnell case last year, I mean, in 2015, um, I submitted a claim for Miss O'Donnell uh, for carryover leave, and I just got no. We asked for the regulation to be changed, and no. And um, we wrote back again, and, and we said, "Listen, this is, would be in compliance with EU law," and it was no. And what what alternative did we have but to go to court? And it ranks of hypocrisy. Um, for us to see statements in the media to say that because PD4 undertook legal action, the, the whole thing was delayed. Sure, what else would we do? I mean, if we don't go to court, it gets stalled in the CNA system and you're just told no after no after no. And you're left with no alternative. And it, you go down to the courts, and it, I mean, I think the costs were approaching 100,000 euros. And 20 minutes before we went into the court, offered to settle. Regulation changed. She gets all her leave back. I mean, that's the, that's the state that's paying that money. And it's the delay on my members, the implementation of that directive. I mean, our members lost 147,000 days leave. If you calculate the value of a day's leave and multiply that by 147,000, you come to 17, 17 to 22 million. That's what the state saved off the back of my members by virtue of the fact that they didn't afford them their entitlements. I mean, I'm lost for words for that. And like I said, it's just rank hypocrisy to see statements to say that PD4, um, because they went to court, done this. I have no regrets going to court anymore. I used to. I, I, I mean, I used to feel it as a personal failing that I couldn't go into CNA process and argue and convince the other side that this was the right thing to do. And here we are, you know, in a situation where I, when I kind of, um, when I write claims, I write them for a solicitor down the road. I, I, I never think of actually, you know, really this is going to be settled here or through the process. I always think, uh, look, ultimately, it would be just a no, and we send it down to the solicitor. Anyway, the ARW delay. Um, there's, a, there's a video that you see on social media of members of the Army Ranger Wing flying along on a boat beside a big ship, and they climb up uh, this ladder on the outside of the ship, and you see them rappelling down out of a helicopter onto the deck. Um, and... But people don't cop. There's no safety nets. These guys fall off that rope or fall out of that chopper. They're injured. And what do we do to them? Under current regulations, uh, we take their allowance off them after 28 days. They go into the hostage house and they fire live bullets. 
And what do we do if they get injured? Take their allowance after, off them after 28 days. It's disgraceful. And I can't change that because of the FEMPI legislation. And that kind of leads on to the question about, you know, um, you're asking, uh, sorry, about the medical asking and stuff like that. But I, I, sorry, I'll digress for a second. But so what happened was in 2010, we went to uh, an independent adjudicator and we, um, we won an award for the Ranger Wing to get an increase of their ARW allowance from, uh, to 200 euros. And I um, appreciate that the financial crash came and the, the award was held in abeyance. We were always told, yeah, that's just there, it'll be paid once the emergency is over. And that would be consistent with the ILO guidelines, which says that, um, you know, once you enter into a, if you're an essential service and you enter into a process and uh, once the award is made by the independent adjudicator, that it is promptly implemented and paid. Um, here we are, situation nine years later and 15 years after the, the amount of money that's actually back, back pay is due, um, they still haven't been paid. I believe if you were the person who was going to send members of the ARW to one of the most dangerous places in the world, be worthy of those men and pay them their money, pay them what they're rightly owed. Give them a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. And the same applies to the chefs, because I, I don't want to forget those guys. I mean, they feed us all. And a lot of those guys have left in the intervening period between 2010 and now. And they've gone out with reduced pension entitlements because the award wasn't made. How fair is that? How fair is that? I mean, these people worked on and through no fault of their own, they came to an age where they were 60 and they were forced out. They had to be forced to leave the Defence Forces. And I know, look at, I've spoken to Senator Cropwell, Senator Layden, I know yourself, you raised it in the Dáil last week. I've spoken to Deputy O'Snodick about it. I've spoken to uh, Senator McFadden. I've spoken to uh, Martin Hayden. I've spoken to Boxer Morn. The dogs in the street know that this has to be paid, that it's right. It's only the fair and proper thing to do. Let's just do it. Let, don't be forcing us to court to get these guys' money down the court. Like, Do the right thing by them, please. That's it. In terms of the medical aid scheme, um, a number of years ago, um, PD4, well, two years ago I think it was, we started off, we, we took 10,000 euros out of our own budget and we said if there's a member who um, needs uh, a medical scan or whatever the case may be, we'll give it to him for free, provided if his contract is going to be come up or whatever the case may be. And then uh, last year, the, my executive, or the executive of PD4, had the, um, was it, the foresight and bravery to take €150,000 out of our association funds and put it into a separate financial vehicle. Uh, it's called the PMAS scheme. And it's the PD4 Medical Assistance Scheme. And what we do now is we send um, our members up to Belfast, King's Hospital in Belfast, to get private treatment. Because um, the, the medical corps is just on its knees as well. I mean, when I joined in 1990, um, there was three hospitals. Uh, there was one in the Corra, there was one in Dublin, and there was one in Cork. And uh, I can remember, I, I, I mean, I, I was an inpatient in all three uh, at some point in time over my career. Um, there's no, nowhere now that a soldier can actually convalesce in the event that he's sick. So God forbid a soldier gets injured overseas in Lebanon. Um, you know, it's one of the most heavily mined places in the world. Uh, a guy I knew was class behind me in the Army Apprentice School in Nace, Gary Maloney, he lost his leg out there on the, I think it was the 80th Battalion the year I was out there. And um, uh, like if something like that was to happen again, we have nowhere to put these guys. Um, we've known where to, to, to have them convalesce. Because, and another point to, to, to sort of consider is that um, there are a lot of resident non-nationals joining the Defence Forces now, and you know, they may not have their own apartment to come back to. They're young, single guys, and it wouldn't be appropriate for them to convalesce in the barracks. 
but we have nowhere for them to put them. Like. So, yeah, PD4, we're taking care of our own now. Um, look at, we'll, <clears throat> we're hoping to expand it out uh, to our members' families down the road and maybe veterans. Like I said, it's, it's, the, we have a long-term plan for the PMAS scheme uh, to try and take care of people. Um, I mean, at the moment, to a certain extent, the vets are taking care of us. Um, we'd like to give back in some small measure down the road. Um, the voting papers. Sorry, Mr. Oh, sorry. I'm reluctant to intervene, but we'll have to have a short or answers because I'm very oh, conscious sorry. that I want to bring in all my, my colleagues. My apologies. My and apologies. some of the yep. issues will arise again. Okay. So if yep. we can have maybe. Okay. The voting, I have to say. Just the... short yep. responses, okay. if possible. Uh, the voting. Um, uh, yeah, we wrote to the we wrote to military management about a week before the voting took place. We were apprehensive that the votes were actually going to get out to people, so uh, we wrote them. And then on the day, we were contacted by a number of members <clears throat> who told us that their commanding officers had wrote them letters, trying to uh, get them to be able to vote in their um, their local polling polling stations. Um, we've asked for an investigation to take place. I know, I think you have as well. Um, um, so. It's, yeah, it's of serious concern to us, and we want it fixed. I think it's a loss of corporate memory within uh, some units, and um, who knows what else. You know, let's, I, I don't want to be, don't want to have conjecture. I, I, we'll just try and get to the bottom of it. In terms of the relationship with the department, um, I think that you know it's frustrating, uh, desperately frustrating uh, at the moment. Um, that's all. I, 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 you know, look at. Um, I've given you the example of the O'Donnell case, the case of the apprentices, and what we're having to do to get stuff over the line. It's just deeply frustrating. It's frustrating for everybody. I mean, you look at the. I mean, the whole IR environment within the state is just in chaos at the moment. Nurses, and now you've got, you know, the, the HSE staff and things like that. Um, so we're not unique, but we are unique in so far as we can't strike, and some. Some goodwill has to come from that. Has to. Um, I mean, that's a restriction that you impose upon us. We can't get around that, apart from going to court. And it's a case of, we, uh, conscious Mr. Chairman, if we lose a case, it costs us 100,000 euros to prove that we were wrong. There has to be an easier way of, of actually getting matters resolved. So, uh, a combination of people. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll pass you over to my colleague, uh, President Mark Keane in relation to that issue, the accommodation. Mr Chairman, uh, Deputy Chambers, uh, yeah, as, as you're well aware, we've seen many false dawns when it comes to accommodation to naval service. Currently, we operate a nine fleet uh, naval service, so if you take on average, we have between 11 and 12 people living on ships. Now, I know there's a lot being said in the media recently that inward investment in the naval service upwards of 55, 60 million euros for a new ship. We agree with that, but we still have older ships. We still have the Orland and Care at 35 years old. These ships have 11 berths on them. That means we have 11 personnel in a room. Now, if you picture this, Deputy, they do 26-day cycle patrols. So that means that's a sovereignty, sovereign maritime patrol. They're 26 days away from the naval base. That's where they spend their time. They come back in for 16-day uh, self-maintenance period. They spend their time on that ship again. Now these people have worked 60, 70 hours on average a week at sea. We take the larger ships, they do up to three to four months away from home, which is the norm in any Navy. They come back, again they have a 16 day cycle that they're back in the naval base for. They also have to perform military duties on board that ship. They are forced to live in where they work. We wouldn't ask anyone else to, we've heard a lot in the media about citizens, or, you know, who can't afford accommodation. Our members are citizens in uniform as well. They deserve a place to put their head at night. They deserve a place to go that they can get off these ships. You know, we, we speak a lot about health and safety and well-being. What about these people's well-being? You know, we, as I said, we've seen a lot of false dawns on this. I can go back as far as 2002, 2000, 2012, when all these announcements were made. I know in the, you know, the financial straitjacket the department's in, we're asking for 11.5 million. We're not asking for a lot when you think of it. So if I'd ask you to consider that, that these men and women you know, they serve the country, they do us proud. You've seen them in the Mediterranean, you've seen them overseas. And then we bring them home, we ask them to, to live in these ships, and that's, that's what we give them back. Thank you, Deputy. Yes. Yep. Um, I move on to, to, to Deputy Grish. Um You asked about other countries and are we catching up and stuff like that. It's apples and oranges. Um, if you look at the British Armed Forces, they would have um, 
have a huge booklet. I know uh, Senator Coppell said beside you, well aware of, of, of the allowances and things like that, but they have housing, um, they have living away for uh, getting you home allowance. They have all manner of allowances um, uh, for, uh, for their, their service personnel. Um, I suppose they kind of go back to they have a, a different sort of a history than, than ourselves. Um, I mean, it's funny actually going through the doll records recently enough, and I found that there was houses in, in um, being built in, in Cove, uh, you know, back in uh, before the, the British Navy left uh, Queenstown as it was then. Um, there was a there was a kind of a history of, of building properties and. It was that, that's impacted significantly on personnel, the fact that we don't have housing, we don't have adequate accommodation for people. Um, and if you look at m most of our armed forces, I mean, I interact a, a lot with the personnel from Euromill, and um, uh, most of them would have adequate housing or married quarters and things like that. We, we stopped that a long, long time ago, and it has had a deep impact on, um, on, on um, the pay and, and allowances of people. Um, the working family payment, uh, in 20, I think in 2012 we raised the issue of working family payment here before the uh, Public Accounts Committee. I think it actually had been raised by uh, a deputy from Cork in the Dáil, I saw the Dáil records, and he, he had actually mentioned it. You're 100% right, 90 is just, it's not acceptable. Um, Look, there's fear. The problem with the problem in the Defence Force at the moment is if you've got, uh, say, those 90 guys, there could be two euros or three, or three euros over the threshold or under the threshold for working family payment. But the minimum payment under the working family payment is 20 euros. But if you get a fiver raise, you're effectively down 15 euros. Um, it's just, it, it beggars belief that soldiers are actually so close to the threshold. So you can say a 90, but you could have, you know, hundreds, thousands who are that close that an increase of 10 euros will actually, you know, take them out of the basket for people who are entitled to work and family payment. That's, I, I don't know. I, 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 and that's the fear that people have. Imagine that. Imagine that soldiers are fearful of a small pay rise because it will mean it costs them money. It's just lunacy, like. It's lunacy. Um, where has it all gone wrong? I mean, like, this didn't happen yesterday. You know, um, it's, this has happened over uh, the last 10 years. FEMPI legislation has contributed a significant amount to it um, because it has imposed this uh, false bureaucratic system on people where, you know, um, you're asked to do more with less. Everybody felt the pressure, um, you know, all public servants came under the scrutiny of, aren't you lucky to have a job like? Uh, and, you know, um, by certain people and certain cohorts. No, there was nobody lucky to have a job. We worked hard uh, and we continue to work hard. Um, I mean, nobody owes nobody a living, but, you know, you can't work people to the bone either like. Um, you deserve your human dignity and your ability to sort of uh, to live a, a, a fair life. So where has it all gone wrong? I, I don't know. Every, there's, a lot, there's a lot of blame to go around and to be shared amongst lots of different people. That's all I can say. Is that okay? Um, can I take now um, Senator McFadden to be followed by Deputy Snuddy, and we're fast running out of time, yeah. unfortunately. Senator McFadden. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, Thank you very much, all of you, for being here today, uh, and also thank you so much for your service to your members. Uh, and, and you know, you're, we feel the frustration that your association and your members feel, because there isn't anyone here who doesn't feel that frustration uh, on your behalf too. Um, before I ask my question, and I will stick to the question, I just want to compliment you on the fact that you have achieved. You know, you sound so uh, almost heartbroken that you haven't achieved enough and I, and I, I feel that it's, it's, so, it's so real and so sincere but you have achieved uh, some things you know and you have re achieved things like having contracts reviewed um, and increased pay scales for the new privates and, uh, and your PEMA scheme. I mean there are things that you have to be um, proud of and, and, and you know we have to commend you for and compliment you for. Um, just 
I won't rehash everything that has been said. I accept completely what you say about the salaries and about the family income support and the idea that it's only 90 that someone said recently. That's a disgrace. Uh, one is one too many on family income support that wears a, a, an Irish uniform, and I've said that um, over a number of times. The, the four outstanding adjudications are the things that I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about now because everything else has been said. Um, I've been on about this, especially the cook technicians, for a very long time, um, and it makes me very sad that a lot of them have retired and haven't received what they were um, promised. Uh, some two of my very dear friends have actually passed away um, since I started this process back in the day, uh, and they still haven't um, been uh, awarded. Um, I understand that there was an offer made to PD4 on the adjudications, and that you know payback as far as the 1st of October. Um, and I just wonder, it's not good enough as far as I'm concerned, it should, you should be, get what you were awarded and, and, and to be no, make no mistake about that. But I just wonder, do you think there's any merit in accepting that as a start, uh, as a way, to, as a way to, to do it, to separate the payment uh, um, and the back, now, from now and the backlog and see can we go from there um, to move this process on, on, your, on the behalf of... of of your members, um, because I understand that you're caught between a rock and a hard place, really, um, I do. But to make it anything, to make a, a step forward on it, do you think that we could separate this, and is there any movement on it? And the last thing I'll ask you, uh, very quickly, is I asked the previous organisation, if you had a magic wand and you could get three things in the morning that are uh, uh, doable, what would the three things be? Thanks, Senator McFadden. Deputy O'Snodig. Yeah, you, you, you said morale is on the floor and like others, so I want to thank you for being here and all the help over, over the years in, in explaining to do, those of us who are on the outside um, looking in. Sometimes it can be very complicated, the different systems and all of that, no more so than any other uh, area of life. Um, you've managed to enlighten many, many of the bits of the, the Defence Forces uh, for me um, and just how you've been managing I don't know, but so I want to thank you for that. But you, you mentioned the morale is on the floor, and um, you, I, I, I don't know whether it can get worse. Um, but how does it feel in terms of morale, having to take court cases? Does that add to a feeling of lower morale, of not being appreciated, being forced to do things which you would not imagine? I presume when you joined the Defence Forces, you had no intention of uh, having to kind of pursue the department uh, and focus a lot of your energy and attentions towards having to fight with them rather than fight for them. Um, and the other question, kind of, which comes again from some of the points that you've already raised, is um, the, 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 the sinful waste that you mentioned of uh, personnel uh, at the age of 50 having to retire. Been, uh, and, and I've ar argued this with the Minister and others that kind of we're, we're a lot further along as a, as a society in the world kind of, uh, that people at 50 are a lot fitter than they were 100 years ago, uh, a lot able. And in the rest of society, we're mo moving towards um, in the public service to 68 as a retirement age and kind of a, 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 in other parts of private sector you can work until you drop basically if, if, if that's what you wish but in the defence forces uh, you're, you're on the scrap heap at, uh, at 50 in, in the eyes of the department how do you feel about that and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, the, other, the other part is um, you know can this be reversed because I, I, I'm here and uh, people raising issues about, for instance, the ma ma mass uh, discharge applications kind of on, on, a, on a single day, kind of several hundred people putting in uh, applications to be discharged for the Defence Force. If that happens, given the chaos that's already there, um, I'd see it as a, 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 a reflection of frustration, but it also it's an in, in, intent because if nothing is delivered, uh, that means that these people um, are saying we've had had enough, and that the defence forces then grind to a halt. And, uh, and if that happens, would you go as far as uh, as some people have said that um, the, the, the minister or the department are betraying their duties? Uh, by not standing up for the Defence Forces and ensuring that it is capable of 
fulfilling its mandate uh, in the fullest terms, and therefore they have to look after uh, the men, men, men and the women of the Defence Force. And finally, just in relation to uh, there's been a number of good developments, and some kind of it, 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 it from, from yourself, and you, 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 you mentioned uh, the PMAP there. Uh, there's also a, a, a separate to that because of the restraints. Uh, on yourselves, there's the Women and Partners Defence Forces group and other, other groups who have uh, raised the issues that you have been also raising uh, and others. Um, how do you feel about them and um, other than, kind of, from my own point, kind of pra praising them that they have the courage to do so? But kind of in, in the past, there wasn't a need because I, th I think uh, people were, were appreci appreciated a lot quicker than, than they seem to be now. And the, f the fact that uh, the wives and partners have to take to the street to raise the issues, or at least profile the issues uh, that you 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 get, but you have to uh, pursue in a different manner. Thanks, Deputy. Can I also bring in Senator Layton and Senator Cockwell now? Senator Layton. Yep. Thank you very much, first of all, Chairman, and uh, thank you for receiving the PD fora. Very short request, and uh, you, Clerk, for facilitating the PD fora, and welcome indeed, <coughs> Mark and President. Donald McGuire, Vice President, Chair Guidance, General Secretary, Martin Bryce, Deputy General Secretary, Amy Timmins, National Executive. Just say, I think you've made a fantastic submission here on behalf of your members. I think my own view is that you're doing an excellent job representing your members. Not all, all is maybe appreciated, but as a non-union, you're definitely doing as much work as any registered union is doing. So let's recognise that, and I think that <clears throat> You're probably a bit hard on yourself, really, because I know the frustration at this point in time, because you were expecting that the Public Services Pay Commission would be report would be now published, and that you would be able to discuss it here today with the members. It's a bit of a disadvantage. Now, it may be no coincidence, the fact that the publication has been delayed, arising from the fact that it was well aware of the Department of Defence that you were coming here today to give evidence before the committee. That being said. You will have <coughs> plenty of opportunities publicly to respond. I hope, we only all hope that you will get what you're entitled to in this report. The delay may be to the point that there is a discussion in government to see how you can accommodate your work because of the frustration and effort you have made. And also the point is made that you have gone to court, there's arbitration going on at the moment, but you actually had to go to court, should have been accepted for that. And finally, just to say, the medical assistance scheme which you established is, is tremendous. I realised that when I was at your national meetings. And uh, I, I, I think, in one sense, it seems a shame that an Army, Navy and Air Force would have to rely on your own means to establish a service for your members. I think a lot of people watching in now would find it hard, actually hard to believe that there isn't a really good medical service hospital for personnel of the numbers. Now, the British Army, for instance, to have a hospital in Ireland called Leperstown Park Hospital. And they've looked after all the retired members in that hospital over the last 50, 60 years. I mean, that's just tremendous now. In fairness to them, they have a lot of resources, more than we have. But to finally say again, uh, I hope uh, to you, Chairman and Clerk, that in due course in the autumn, that after the situation has come, become more clear, that you would meet at some stage for a short meeting with PD4 uh, in the autumn, depending on the outcome of the actual report. And I just want to wish you well and your former executive well, and back to John Lucy, who was your founder secretary. Thanks very much. Thanks, Senator Layton. Senator Crockwell. Thank you very much. I'm going to spare you all the uh, welcomes. You all know who I am, and I know who you are. We all served. Um, so, questions. Uh, is it true that a number of naval ships have been taken out of service because we don't have personnel? Um, with respect to uh, representation at a national level uh, under an umbrella group, uh, it has been said that you may affiliate with uh, ICTU. Uh, your colleague representation bodies and the Gardaí would prefer to see something like the Armed Services Pay Review Body that you have in the UK. Have you got a preference or would you accept either? Uh, next, is it time for another Gleason report uh, into the Defence Forces, um, and uh, how soon would you like that to happen? Next, 
You have come under serious uh, criticism for failing to instruct your members or to write your, to your members to ask them to support public parades. I think the public are entitled to know why you couldn't do that. Um, I, I know why you couldn't, your members know why you couldn't, but I think the public are, are entitled to know. The Department of Defence says that there's no problem in the strength of the Defence Force and the organisation is at 93%. I'd love you to explain that one to me because I cannot see 93 per cent. 8,300 8, into 9,500 is not 93 per cent. Um, how's your relationship with military management? Are military management 100 per cent behind PD4, PD4 at this stage? And the last one, the issue of sergeants at 50 years of age. We have pilots being brought back to the Air Corps recently, a captain and a lieutenant colonel brought back. There is an open invitation to commissioned officers to return. I have personal friends who are sergeants who are coming up on the uh, discharge, uh, who are 50 years of age, fit, highly qualified, highly skilled men. What's happening with respect to inviting them to remain on to keep the skills we have? I think I'll leave it at that, Mr Chairman. I could talk all day on this, but you've been very kind. Well, you may do that at the weekend to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> as welcome as your contribution is, Senator Crockwell, but that won't be all. Um, Mr Guinan, we're gone into yeah. injury time. Okay. We've, I'm going to weigh into injury time seven minutes, please, and we, ha we have to be out of this room, okay. actually, and we have another meeting as well. So, uh, I'll start off with De Deputy McFadden. Um, uh, uh, have you a question, Senator Deputy Hayden? Yes. A, a very half a minute, please. Um, look, uh, thank you very much, um, PD4, for coming in, for the great work you do. Um, and, you know, I, I've followed the, the contributions here this morning and, um, you know, the, the points you, you make, and you continue to make in a very constructive manner. And I suppose, just in relation to the Public Sector Pay Commission, we know that is the mechanism for trying to address the shortfalls that there are in allowances and stuff. Uh, as a representative body, how do you plan to gauge the reaction of your members when that uh, report does come? Um, you know, in levels of engagement, in terms of process afterwards, it's really important that you know you're given the time and space, and your members are uh, to consider uh, all of the outcomes of that. And we hope it's as beneficial as possible uh, to your members, and we definitely want to see that. And thanks, uh, Mr. Address, but you might just touch on the um, on the process yeah, there afterwards. They've all been asked already. We're short of time. Mr. Yeah. Gaynor, thanks, Deputy Head. Um, okay, I'll start with Senator McFadden's. Uh, yeah, the, the outstanding adjudications from 2010. Um, look, at, if government wants to impose upon us the fact that they're going to pay them from the 1st of October 2018, they can argue that that it constitutes promptly to them. We can't accept, I mean, just that. Uh, these men deserve more. Um, and I know I've, I've, I've plagued uh, uh, Deputy Hayden and, and, and others, uh, you know, here, uh, Senator Crowell, uh, about that, the need for these adjudications to be actually implemented. Um, look, at, that's my bottom line. If, if, they, if the government impose, upon that, uh, impose that upon us, that they'll pay them from the 1st of October, grand, it gives us the fighting chance to go back and go to the courts and, and argue for the back payment. I think there's a liability, the, the state has accepted a liability at this point in time with effect from the 1st of October. Ye may call that prompt. We don't call that prompt. We'll argue that down the courts. Um, but look, at, we need everybody to row in behind this now at this point in time and actually get that over the line for us. Um, I, I know you've got people in that loan. I, I know that your dad was a sergeant major down there at one point in time. So, look, at, uh, I, I get that. I, you know, I, I get that, you're, you're, um, you know, that you had friends who were chefs and stuff like this. But it is, from, from my perspective, grossly unfair. Grossly unfair. Um, Deputy O'Snoddick, I rush through them. You've been a, a very welcome year to me, um, you know, for the, for the past couple of years. Um, you've uh, look at any time I phoned, you've picked up the line, uh, and I know that you advocate strongly for for us as well. Um, uh, you, you ask, you know, what the relationship was uh, inside in the doll, um, or inside, with us with the department. It's not good, but I have to work with these people. I, I, you know, um, I can't... Um, we're apolitical. Defence Force is apolitical. Uh, we're bound by Defence Force Regulation S6, uh, and 
uh, section 27, which prohibits us from engaging in public commentary of a political nature. Um, so, if you wouldn't mind, I leave it at that. You know, uh, look, dogs in the street know that there's a problem in the defence forces. Um, but from our perspective, we try to play the ball and not the man. Um, we, our members deserve everything we can give them. Uh, you know, that, that's all. And the state is, you know, owes them that because they, they, they work with those restrictions. Um, I can't remember, was there, was there anything else or what was specific? Right. Oh, the, the, yeah. Um, the age profile, look, at, you're absolutely 100% correct. I mean, and we've talked about this. Uh, 50 is just an arbitrary figure. I mean, back in 1994, it was, oh, you can serve as a private up until 21 or whatever the case may be. Sure, I mean, I know privates who are 50 and they could run me into the ground like. Why not have a, a subjective criteria to select who gets to stay on in the Defence Forces as opposed to an objective criteria? Again, look, at we've prepared court proceedings for that as well, if it comes down to it. I know in military management there are, are strong advocates for increasing the age uh, for you know, sergeants and things like that, and they've done it for the 21-year contracts. We've got them up until 2022. Let's just hope that cool minds uh, prevail in respect of this and that people are allowed to remain in service for, for longer. The wives and partners, um, you mentioned those, they are the wives and partners of our members and we are grateful for what they do. Um, I think Senator Crawford had asked me, so I'm going to cut, a, cut across two answers here. Um, you know, yeah, we are, look, I marched. I, I, I went on the Dick Two Day of Protest in 2013. I would have been at uh, public meetings in relation to barrack closures back in the day. Defence Force regulations, um, they're not specific. You, you know, the, 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 you can, provided they're not political, you, you, can, you can attend public gatherings and things like that. Um, but there was particular circumstances last September that gave rise to a situation where um, we, we had thought about issuing the 2013 circular, which basically informed members of their rights, but then something happened and we just couldn't issue that circular and we ended up going down the courts. And as much as people will criticise us, we're in this for the long haul. We want to sort of have rights down the road. It'd be populist. Yeah, other, other organisations issued letters and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, but they're, they're not engaged in court actions. We're the ones that in, that's engaged in all the court actions. And we know the rules surrounding that. You can't, there's a rule for courts in terms of going down with clean hands. Clean hands principle. Like. And if you want equity, you must do equity. Um, you have to play by the rules. It's not nice. It's been very hard in our association, in my executive to try and, you know, to balance um, the public relations aspect of PD4 with what, you know, with what members want, and, and members want to fight. They want to see us fighting as well. And like I said, we have no problem fighting. I went to numerous uh, public gatherings, went on that ICTU Day Parade, um, and members of the executive did. We have no problem going uh, to public events to show our dissatisfaction. But the thing about it is, you have to, we're, we're, we're you have to obey laws. We're, we're subject to military law. That, um, they're, like I said, the wives and partners, the veterans, they've been really good to us. I think for those that, if you're watching, we appreciate it. I, but I cannot engage in public agitation. Our association can't. We can't make commentary of a political nature. Those are the rules for us. We have to abide by them. It can't, you can't expect respect and, and, you know, then at the same time not give it. That's, that's it for us, you know, it's, and it's bad. It's, it's, it hurts to see stuff about us. ICTU, um, since 1994, we wanted into ICTU. Peter Cassells appeared at our conference, and I want to thank all the deputies who voted for that last week. And, you know, Michael McNamara years ago had a bill, who actually, a um, Labour bill, that was a private member's bill that, that you know, looked for affiliation to It was that, I mean, last week, the, the bill was private member's motion, and I understand that he can't be implemented as such. Same with Michael McNamara's a couple of years ago. It was just a private member's, mo private member's bill, and it was passed. We want into ICTU. In terms of the standing, like the Gleeson, Gleeson commented in his introduction that it had been 60 years since 
there was ever an independent review. He was the first independent review of Defence Forces pay and allowances. Um, we're 30 years on from Gleeson. There is a need for a review of Defence Forces pay. Plain and simple. At the moment, I am working off two different pay rates, three different pensions, and various different contracts. Sure, I walk into a room of 100 and something guys, and if I start talking figures, guys are saying, is that my salary, or is that your salary, or is that his pension? Um, in terms of the magic wand, sorry, I, I just remembered magic wand. Pay, pensions, work and time directive. They're all doable. The pensions are horrific for people who go past 2004. I went around to every barracks in the country last year and I told people about their pensions. The, the fact that we're compulsory retired at a certain age and then you don't get your pension until you're, you know, 60, um, it's crippling to people. You are creating a system where there's a, a significant moral hazard uh, in the system. I won't go into it, but look at the pensions need the pensions, pay and allowances, and the working time directive. They are the, the magic wand. All doable. All doable. Ship's been tied up. Ship's been tied up. Um, Very quickly, please. Sorry. Uh, not operational. It, it, that's an operational matter as to whether ships have been tied up because lack of pers personnel. The Navy is down. You know, they're down personnel. They're at their probably lowest ebb ever. Uh, draw your own conclusions from it. In 1990, there were ships tied up, and we actually had more personnel, and we had less ships. Sure, you know, if you do the maths on that, reverse engineer that sort of answer, and you'll find out why there's, a, there's your ships been tied up. Um, was there anything else? Very quickly, please. We're way beyond time, unfortunately. Yeah, Senator Hayden, just in regards to the, the, the PMAS scheme yes. that you were, you were just chatting about, look at, we represent some of the best people in the public service, and Deputy Chambers touched on it earlier on in Joe remarked on his open statement. These are the lowest paid in the public sector. What does it say about our members that they're willing to pay into a fund to make sure that their own comrades get medical treatment? I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you very much. I want to thank um, Mr. Guinan and his colleagues, Amy, Mark, Martin and Donna, for their presentation here this morning. And I think it's very clear from the contribution of all my colleagues that these are very serious issues. I think it's a matter of respect for the, for the members of the Permanent Defence Forces. And at all meetings where we, def where we discuss defence issues here, we always make sure that we pay due tribute to the great work of the service that your members give to our state. And in return, the state should be properly recognised in that work, that commitment, and the dangers that your members face on a daily basis. It's, it's clear from your presentation that it's not just about money. There are monetary issues that need to be addressed, but there are also governance issues relationships with the department and the way the department and the defence forces do their business as well. I can assure you that these are issues, as you refer to in your opening contribution, that we will keep pursuing as a committee. We will be having discussions with the minister in the future as well, and we will raise all of these issues, both in correspondence to the minister and to the department in advance of meeting with the minister as well. And as Senator Terry Layton suggested, we will be having yourselves and RACO we will give you an opportunity in the, in the autumn to have further discussions on these issues because I think we want to send a clear message that the welfare and the pay and conditions of the members of the Permanent Defence Forces are of concern to the committee and to the Oireachtas and that's a view shared right across all members here and that's, that's a, an issue. Those are issues that we will pursue because I come from an area that has a proud and long tradition in having very substantial numbers employed in the Department of Defence Forces since the foundation of the state, and I know of the commitment of individuals, of families, going back many generations, where, they've, where they continue to give great service to our country. And we want to ensure that that is recognised. So again, a sincere thanks for your presentation here this morning. This meeting now stands adjourned until 2 p.m. today, when we will meet with Antonis to discuss matters raised and discussed at the Foreign Affairs Council meetings. We also have an informal meeting commencing now at 11am with representatives of the OECD. Thank you all. Thank you very much.